Hi, everyone, and welcome to yet another one of my podcast YouTube videos on Gaudi Mitzpez 22. I have a return guest I'm excited about, a former student of mine, now PhD, Dr. Rachel Coleman, Assistant Professor of Theology at Assumption University in Massachusetts. I asked you this last time, Rachel, university or college? I think it's university. 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 Yeah, they're all universities now. Yes. No such thing as a college anymore. <laughs> we, we, we determined that when we were discussing things with Hauser and <laughs> Adrian. Yeah. Adrian. Huh? Oh, and Adrian it, Walker. Yeah. yeah, Adrian Walker. <laughs> Big shout out to them. But uh, I asked Rachel to come on to do a podcast with just uh, her, her and I, uh, she and I, because she has this great article in the latest issue of Comunio, which is called The Flesh. Uh, and her article is called Matter as Revelation of God's Love. Now, as a backstory to this, uh, Rachel did her doctoral, dis doctor, I should say, Dr. Coleman. Uh, <laughs> you're Rachel to me and always yeah. will be. But uh, <laughs> uh, she did her doctoral dissertation on the philosophy and ontology of Ferdinand Ulrich, uh, uh, who was a German philosopher. And... Uh, he is just now recently coming into his own in the English speaking world. He's always, he was always kind of well known in the, in the German uh, speaking world. Uh, his book, Homo Abyssus, which was recently translated by David C. Schindler into English, should be standard reading for everyone. Uh, the difficulty, however, arises from the fact that Ferdinand Ulrich is not an easy philosopher to understand, even for folks like me who generally appreciate and understand dense metaphysical Germanic <laughs> kind of stuff. I did my dissertation after all on Balthazar. So uh, with that in mind, the, her article here, Matter as Revelation of God's Love, is essentially attempting to do two things. And I would highly recommend you read it. The first thing is it's, it's laying out the problematic of what we mean by matter, which is at the beginning of the article. And then it proceeds to a discussion of where Ferdinand Ulrich's metaphysics helps us to understand how matter is actually uh, not simply a kind of Manichaean dualistic drag on, on our pure spirit, but actually is a manifestation of God's love. All right. So uh, without further ado, the beginning of the article, you talk about uh, Plato's uh, Timaeus and the concept of matter that emerges in the Timaeus, especially around the translation of the Greek word Kora in English, C-H-O-R-A. So maybe you, why don't you uh, unpack for, for starters here, as we're discussing the, the significance of matter, the, the Platonic view in the Timaeus. Yeah, I mean, I the first thing I want to say is I'm not, I, I love the Timaeus, um, wouldn't ever call myself an expert in the Timaeus, but it, it's pretty much where I start because, you know, it doesn't hurt to start with Plato ever. <laughs> um, and then also because it's kind of the first time we really see something along the lines of what we now sort of often speak about as matter articulated. Um, so yeah, so the Timaeus, just in case um, anyone doesn't know, right, it's sort of where the platonic dialogue, where a, a cosmology is laid out. I, I, I think that it's... Um, what Plato thinks. Um, there's some debate about that, as there always is with Plato, about what he actually thinks. <laughs> yeah, because um, <laughs> everything uh, is through the lips of characters. Yes, exactly. So this all comes through, not through Socrates, but actually through this character Timaeus, who I don't believe we ever see again in any other dialogue. Um, and yeah. he kind of comes from elsewhere. So anyway, all of that's to say is, but Socrates is there, of course, right? And Socrates asks Timaeus to kind of lay out his understanding of his cosmology. And um, so uh, it's really a, a fascinating dialogue for a lot of reasons, um, not least because um, in it, we have sort of a connection between the the sort of heavens and then also man, right? And so, or, um, and then the city. And so man becomes kind of like the hinge point between the two. Right. Um, but also there's this um, introduction of this word Quora, right? Um, and uh, Timaeus goes through a, a good part of the dialogue sort of explaining these two realms, right? The, the realm of being and the realm of becoming, right? And our world would be sort of the realm of becoming, right? We're, we're never fully sort of what we are. We're always changing into what we are. 
And then about halfway through the dialogue, he kind of stops and says, actually, we need to sort of redo this entire um, cosmology by adding what he calls a sort of third category. And this third category is what he names Quora. And like so many of the Greek words, um, right, translation into English is not exact, right? Um, and so a lot of times Quora gets uh, translated as space, um, it, but it also kind of means place, right? Like it doesn't mean space, like outer space. It means like a, a particular place for something. Um, and then, um, but it also has this connotation of kind of like chaos to a certain extent. So yeah, let um, me uh, interrupt. I'll read yeah. here from your footnote number four from Peter Kalkavich. You say Peter Kalkavich writes in his glossary of the Timaeus quote, this ordinary Greek word defies translation once Timaeus breathes new meaning into it, a common enough word, Cora refers to a place, space, or field. It is, the, it is the room or expanse in which something is or belongs. As Timaeus' third kind, the Cora or receptacle is neither mere place, since it is constantly in motion, nor empty space, because it is full of powers and traces of the four elements. The word space conveys the appropriate indeterminateness of the Cora to construct the four elements and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I just I, I interrupted you because I thought that's a pretty good summary of what you what you were just trying to articulate there. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So. so but, but anyway, I didn't mean to co-opt your own explanation of it and say, <laughs> Cal Cabbage's explanation is better than she's giving. Well, so I, better, I put it there for a reason. So. But you did footnote it for a reason. <laughs> and and so I'm going to I was going to drag it in. So what is the significance of this indeterminateness to? Yeah, I mean, so go, go ahead. It seems like I mean, I'm just going to use the word Timaeus to sidestep the issue of whether Plato actually thinks this or not. But yeah. um, it seems like Timaeus um Right. And his articulation of how of the the sort of ontology or the cosmology of his own cosmology. Right. He understands that there has to be this right the realm of being. And then he also understands that there's this realm of becoming. But when he says that, you know, we have to redo this in light of this third realm, it seems like he seems to um, understand that this that there's the realm of becoming is not self-evident only in light of the realm of being, right? Like how does the becoming happen, right? How, what, um, if, if we only have the realm of being and we only have the realm of becoming, like where, where does the stuff that is becoming come from? Um, and so he posits this third realm or this third kind, um, which he calls Cora. And, um, again, I'm still thinking about this, um, but like, one of the things that's very interesting to me is he compares the realm of being to the father and the realm of um, Cora to a mother, right? And and even sort of calls it a womb, actually, right? It's where all things are generated, right? And they um, they they sort of get their um, what's the word? They get their uh, substance, we might say, like from the realm of uh, of Cora. Um, and so this is sort of the first time that we we see something that we end up calling matter later on. Um, and um, and so what Timaeus says is that the realm of being is, or excuse me, the realm of becoming is essentially the child of the realm of being and the realm of Cora. Um, that something from both realms uh, uh, contributes to the the world that we know. The other interesting thing he says about the realm of Korra is that one can only really kind of think about it through a bastard reasoning. And what he means by that is it doesn't exist in and of itself, right? And so um, we use reason about things that exist. And so he says, you can only sort of think about this realm sideways, as it were, like kind of like, like giving it a glance out of the corner of your eye. You can't actually sort of focus on it because it itself does not exist. And yet, it's something that contributes to the world that we um, that we all inhabit. Yeah. Uh, and so so much of this, then, uh, as we can see, is is being driven by the the one could say the Greek obsession, but also perhaps put it to put it in a more positive light, the Greek insight that there is a problematic philosophically 
between the the realm of the one and the realm of the many. Yes. <laughs> you know, the realm of change and becoming and the realm of being and transcendence and immortality and changelessness. And it leads to all of those Greek, the, the vacillation between myth and philosophical monism, between dialogical elements and as both as I would say, the dialogical elements of Greek religion and the more monistic elements of Greek right. philosophy. And it and it, and you know, and this this is the driving force. Um, and, and, and it's just it it becomes hard, therefore, for so, so the Greeks to understand matter as such as as some sort of solid, unchanging thing uh, that the realm of being then somehow comes down and like a tinker toy makes crap out of. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's it's more complicated than that. Right. So let's 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 move on then from the Timaeus. You uh, Oh, geez, I'm hitting something on my keyboard here. You say on page 509, then this is, in short, the mystery and meaning of matter. One, our understanding of matter has transformed and developed since Plato. But in this section of the Timaeus, Plato articulates a fundamental tension with which this strange aspect of our existence presents us. Matter or potency is not something we can entirely get our hands or heads around, so to speak. Matter is clearly what distinguishes us and the world we inhabit from non-material being, and as such, it must contribute in some way to our very existence. At the same time, however, matter also seems to weigh us down. It contributes to our way of being such that nothing we desire or move toward is ever immediate. We must always wait and work for the end toward which we aim. Matter thus seems to impose a patience on us that can be very tiresome. As both Augustine and Aquinas affirm, matter is prope nihil, properly nothing in itself. And yet in order to explain our world and our very selves, we must try to understand this dimension of reality. Matter is clearly bound up with what it means to be human, but it is less clear what exactly that meaning is. Heidegger famously wrote that, quote, the first of all questions is why are there beings at all rather than nothing? And yet perhaps the following question in some way is even closer to us. Why are there beings in this way? That is to say, why matter and therefore material being? I think that is a brilliant paragraph, Rachel, which is why I quoted it in full, because I think it nicely captures uh, the great problematic with its inherent ambiguity that we're talking. So maybe you could riff on that quote just a bit for my own thoughts um <laughs> yeah just develop that a little bit you know just sort of unpack yeah. it for the listeners uh yeah. what's the what's the problematic here what you know what what do we mean when we call matter prime matter in that aristotelian sense which is related to all of this yeah Ooh, i mean those are a lot of yeah there's a lot of there's a lot there i'll just say that so, <laughs> so i mean the first thing is yeah it, you know i mean the way the one of the reasons I sort of wrote that all out is because, you know, ultimately, right, I'm going to argue that actually matter sort of um, if we study matter, it teaches us not only what it means to be a creature, but also like what what God was sort of thinking, if I could say something as bold as that. Right. In creating yeah. the world in this way. Right. Um, uh, and so it is true, though, I think I think there is an ambivalence in the Greeks. I think there's there's less. Um, I think there's, I think sometimes we get an overly simple picture of Plato and Aristotle both and how they view matter. And I, I actually think there's more ambivalence than a lot of people um, toward matter than a lot of people normally interpret them. Okay. Um, uh, but there is an ambivalence, right? Um, and uh, they, um, meaning, you know, it, it, it is the case that it, you keep talking. I have to okay. adjust my microphone, but go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Keep speaking. I, I can right. hear you. Oh, thank you. All right. It is the case that like, you know, matter sometimes feels like it, it, it literally like it weighs us down, right? Anybody who's ever been hurt sort of feels the, um, the fact that like their, their bodies don't do what they want them to do actually. Right. Um, and it's also the case that like, matter sometimes um, obfuscates, or at least it it seems like that, right? Like the fact that, you know, um, yeah. I can look, I can look out my window and I can see not just um, three different birch trees, right? Which is the case, but like, I mean, so many different kinds of trees. And then the question is like, well, wait a second, like what actually is 
a tree then, right? If I have all of these different instances of it, how, how do I come to understand like what actually is a tree? Whereas if we just sort of, I mean, and again, this is sort of mutatis mutandis, but like if we just had sort of like an immediate like beam of the idea of tree into our minds, right? It would be, it seems like it would be utterly clear, right? The fact that we, that matter sort of obfuscates things or at least makes things a lot more complicated seems to be a weight on us a lot. Um, yeah. And uh, and so we can we can read this, Right. And and people have, in fact, I mean, you mentioned the Manichaeans earlier, right? We can read this as a punishment, essentially. Um, something that sort of made us uh, you know, something that either we did to to um earn this punishment, um, and, or something that was just sort of that we need to like escape from, right? Um yeah, now yeah. going to um Plato and Aristotle, I and mean, one of the reasons I like the Timaeus so much is precisely because I think it demonstrates this, what I've been calling ambivalence rather than abhorrence towards matter, right? Um, you know, uh, Plato doesn't, like Timaeus doesn't sort of simply talk about matter as, as if it's a weight. He actually, I mean, he calls it a womb, right? I mean, that's not a bad thing. Um, it's this, it's a generative um, element to his cosmology. Um, and then, and then you have, I mean, flash forward uh, several <laughs> centuries, you have the, the possibly the most famous Neoplatonist Plotinus, who has, you know, in the Aeneids, um, a, a sort of against the Gnostics, right? He, he's, he, and he talks about how harmony is not possible without multiplicity, right? Harmony, which, which the Greeks would yeah. consider the most beautiful, right? That's not possible without multiplicity, which is enabled by matter, right? So just to say that, now, to go to Aristotle, right, I think um, Aristotle, again, uh, yeah, I, I want to think about this more. I'll probably be thinking about it forever. But um, I think that Aristotle, one of the things Aristotle does in the physics in particular is, and again, like I, the way that I tend to interpret Aristotle is not um, as arguing with Plato, but rather trying to sort of maybe figure out with ever more accuracy what some things that Plato may have left um, vague, right? And so when that, with regards to matter, I think that um, Aristotle points out that there are what he calls sort of two types of non-being, right? So whereas Plato seemed to only think, he just had this sort of catch-all term fora, Aristotle says, well, wait a second, there seems to be two types of, of non-being, right? And one he calls deprivation, Right. And that that deprivation would be sort of taking away from being right. He calls that non-being properly speaking. But then this other thing he calls hule, which is what we what we would now refer to as matter. Right. Um, so right, when you right. talk about a hylomorphic unity, right, the, the matter form unity. Um, and and so it's interesting to me that Plato is like, well, actually, we have to distinguish between two two types of non-being. What what Plato may have left sort of as one. Right. Aristotle saying, no, 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 there's there's two different types here. But again, to me, what that points out is um, a, that there's ambivalence there. Right. Not um, not sort of abhorrence, but actually like there's something contributing to to the world as we know it. And that is a good thing, actually. Um, and and Arist Aristotle wants to distinguish that between what we would sort of maybe call the parasitic or or what he calls deprivation. Right. Yeah. Um, on, on being itself. Um, and so I think in the distinction between those two, he's moving towards saying, um, we need to pay attention to this uh, um, as something that generates our world, or at least um, uh, contributes to our world um, in uh, as we know it. Um, and then so eventually he'll articulate uh, what he calls prime matter, right? Um, and that's in both the physics and the metaphysics in particular. Um, and again, I think sometimes people read prime matter as if Aristotle thinks there's like a bunch of stuff in like another realm and somewhere. And that is, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be very bold and just say that is the, that's wrong, right? Like prime yeah. matter is not just like, because we're so we're conditioned, um, you know, sort of modernly to think about matter as stuff, right? Um, yeah. And uh, Aristotle, as I understand him, does not think of prime matter as like you know a a, a bunch of stuff laying somewhere that then um, somehow sort of gets picked up by forms 
right? And brought into the world as we know it. Rather, I think prime matter, as Aristotle talks about it, and I, I think this is the way Thomas reads Aristotle in this as well, um, is that uh, prime matter is a sort of um, a readiness to be taken up into being, right? Um, and so that doesn't mean that it's a, a thing in and of itself, right? We have a really hard time not thinking um, in a kind of reified way. Again, because the modern imagination, I think, is fairly small. well in the mac in the macro world, we're all Newtonians, right? Yes, exactly. And so, um, but but there is a difference between uh, what we might call sort of sheer passivity, like a, a total nothingness, right, and a, and a readiness, right? And um, from you know from one side of it, they look no different they just both look like nothing right but yeah. the, almost sort of after the fact you see that um a ready readiness had to be on its way to being already versus a sheer nothingness right i mean sometimes the the image that i use is the difference between like somebody's hand being totally flat right and you can't receive anything that way and somebody's hand being like it cupped in a ready position to receive something um and the readiness actually takes some sort of um uh i mean in our the re the readiness here takes some sort of like activity and again we have to use yeah. language very metaphorically here when it comes to the matter because as i point out in the article over and over again right you can't even properly use the word is about matter um but it's only sort of in light of yeah. being itself that you start to see what matter is so to speak i often get people writing to me saying you know when i talk about things like this which isn't often, but once in a while you have to, uh, they say, think, well, this is so horribly abstract, hard to get your brain around. So counterintuitive, you know, how can this possibly form the foundation of a coherent metaphysic of a coherent philosophy and so forth to which I say, have you ever tried to understand quantum physics? Right. Have you ever tried to, I mean, I can understand it and I have read and read and read and read in quantum physics. And then, after a while, the only the reason why it's so hard for you and I to understand quantum physics is because after a while, the only proper way to explain what is going on on the quantum level is through the use of comparative mathematical models. Uh, in other words, various abstractions. <laughs> and and what we discover is that the further down we go into this, you know, looking for the Higgs boson and then what's under the Higgs boson and what's under this is, is we, we discover there's no there there in a sense. We, we, we discover that it's an observer oriented universe and collapsing various potential states into states. Now, it's, I don't want to make it sound as if, oh, quantum physics and Aristotelian concepts of prime matter are the same thing because they're not. They're they're occupying different realms. Nevertheless, there there are there are points of analogical contact there where, to which you could say, at the very least, quantum physics is pointing in the same direction yeah. uh, of, of a, ne a need for in order for matter to be truly material in that macro sense that we all understand it. It first must always already be a kind of inchoate indeterminateness. Yes. <laughs> that yeah. is then that is then formed in some mysterious way into what we call matter. That's the first thing I'll say. The second thing is I'm so happy to hear you uh, really unpack well the, the fact that um, the Platonic system in particular, but also clearly Aristotelianism, are not anti-world. These are not there's a dualistic element in their thinking, uh, but it's not an anti-world, anti-material uh, kind of Manichaean dualism, just as uh, so often the Platonic notion of the divided line, the divided line between the world of change and the world of changelessness of matter and spirit, if you will, or archetypal forms, uh, that that divided line represents a kind of point of demarcation between corruption and incorruption or uh, and any entry of forms into the corrupted realm is a descent, a fall, uh, something along those lines, which then really then leads to a lot of anti-body, anti-world dualism, and then mislabeled as Platonic. Uh, and, and so the actual reality in Greek philosophy is far more complex. Yeah. Nevertheless, that's all preamble to me saying, to set up then what is the specific Christian metaphysical contribution here? There is, like you, like you did summarize, there remains an ambiguity. 
a deep, deep ambiguity in Greek thinking that's unresolvable, even in its highest expression. I would say probably the highest expression would, that comes closest to the Christian would be Plotinus. I don't know if you'd agree or disagree with that. I, I, I get that essentially from Balthazar, who seems right. to think the yeah. Plotinian thing comes pretty close. Yeah. Um, uh, so what would then, in the midst of that deep ambiguity in Greek thought, where there's still there is still this tension between uh, matter and form and the material and the immaterial, even if it's not an anti-world tension, there's tension there. How, what is Ul, uh, the Christian contribution uh, and how does Ulrich go about this? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the, I mean, it's probably overly simple, but the simplest way to talk about it, especially when we're talking about a kind of, um, when we're talking about metaphysics versus like any other um, area, right, is this, the revelation of creation ex nihilo, right? Yes. Um, and so, because I, I mean, I think with, um, as you said, Plotinus, but even Plato and Aristotle, I actually think they get cl closer to that than a lot of people realize, but they 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 cannot be sure, right? And um and they cannot sort of really sort of come down and say, oh yeah, I think that this happened. I, it's I, not I the centerpiece of their thought. No, yeah, it's that's not the linchpin. It's not the yeah. linchpin upon upon which. So in other words, it's not a central insight upon which everything else flows. Yes, although I, they have the insight somewhere. I think so. I, I, or at least like it pops up every once in a while. Right. right? Like, right. Even in certain ways that you read the Timaeus, you're sort of like, wait a second. Like, do you like, do you think that the good made the world, like created the world? Like it's, you know, so, <laughs> so, um, but it, yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it that it's not. Well, they have the insight, but they really don't know what to do with it. Right. Yeah. Precisely because they don't have revelation. Yeah. And so in, in the revelation of creation ex nihilo, right. I mean, that the world is created out of nothing. What, what you sort of, and I mean, and the corollary of course is a Trinitarian God. I think it, it, that has to yeah. be the case, right. But, yeah. um, meaning that God did not need to create to fulfill anything in himself. Right. Um, God is, wasn't lonely. I mean, that's again, an overly simple way of putting it. But, yeah. Um, and oh. so, <laughs> Oh God, I'm so lonely. <laughs> so, um, so which means, right? Those those two doctrines um, of revelation then allow us to sort of state with confidence, we might say, that God wanted the world to be and to be in this way, actually, right? Um, uh, that He didn't create the world out of matter as sort of like a second prize or because he had to or something like that, that God, in fact, right, created the world um, at, as we under, as we know it, right, um, because he wanted it to be this way. And so then that, it seems to me, radicalizes sort of all of these insights, right, um, that Plato and Aristotle have bestowed upon us, it seems to me, right, meaning that we now have to take these things far more seriously, right? Why, why this way, right? Why, why is the world in this way? Not we, there's, there's never a moment where we can be like, well, this was just sort of like, you know, uh, a compromise, <laughs> right? That, that the maker had to, had to, um, had to do in order to create the world or something like that. Right. And, um, and so I think, I mean, one of the reasons I was attracted to Ulrich, um, you know, as a student is precisely for that reason. You know, I, my interest in metaphysics has been around since I was your student. Uh, and, um, yeah. and um, but also because he takes the created world um, at, as structured as it is so seriously. Um, and so then, um, you know, his, his metaphysics of creation is what I wrote on. And then in particular, right, how matter, um, what seems to me to be unique about Ulrich is that, matter is um a a central uh uh a central sort of um point around which his metaphysics of creation really sort of revolves right and that seems to me to be something new um or um that he's bringing um our understanding of matter to the forefront of our of his metaphysics of creation why is matter so important it's not an afterthought, um, which it seems to be in a right. lot of other places um, for a lot of other thinkers. So, for example, like in my dissertation, I um, go into uh, 
because Ulrich does this in his dissertation, um, I go into Suarez and Scotus a bunch about their metaphysics. And what's interesting is their understanding of matter only comes as a result of like what they already thought about being, right? And because of that, at least Ulrich thinks that they get matter wrong. They both end up kind of in different ways reifying matter. Right, Whereas right. if you start with matter, right? And you're like, all right, here, here is kind of the the lowest of the low, the 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 I'm, I'm, foundation is the wrong word because you know it's not a thing in and of itself. But if you start with the smallest and then build your metaphysics from there um uh you you start to get revelations about being that um you could you didn't see before i think um and so matter is not an afterthought for ulrich um it's it's almost where he starts i think actually yeah and so that leads then to the let me let, i'm looking for a quote here uh from your article uh I can't find it. But anyway, uh, the, the Ulrich obviously is going to build on this uh, concept of matter as intended by God. All right. So it, it, it doesn't represent a fall. Right. It doesn't represent a punishment for sin. It doesn't represent a we're lesser than the angels because we're, we have a material side to us. It's a positive perfection of creation. It's a reflection of some analog within God himself, right. uh, whatever that might be. Uh, and, and therefore, I mean, as I used to tell my students, uh, I don't know if you were in one of the classes where I did, you know, when, in the context of talking about the resurrection of the body, I would say the, the fundamentally important thing about the Christian insight about the resurrection of the body is that, uh, we, as human beings, constitutively are material beings. We have bodies. Uh, and therefore, if we are to pass into the next life without bodies, we are not passing into the next life as ourselves, as humans. Right. Uh, and, and so there has to be some kind of even embodied being in the next life for us, whatever mysteriously that might mean. But all of it points towards what you were just saying, that the creation of, of matter uh, is not in fact a diminishment at all, but some kind of positive perfection that God is shooting for here. And Ulrich attests to this. Now, Ulrich then ties it, as far as I can understand, into the concept then of all of our existence, which is non-subsistent, being gift. And, there, and so he falls into the whole gift reception motif of creation. Perhaps you can unpack that a little bit, because I don't completely... In other words, Ulrich makes this leap that I don't completely understand between the non-subsistent nature of being to it necessarily, therefore, being a kind of expression of gift or something. And I, I kind of have a sense of what he means, but maybe you can highlight this a little bit better for us. Yeah. So um, I, I said this in my last uh, podcast with you, not with Adrian, but just me and you and Rodney. So I apologize if this is repetitive, but I think. Oh, no. Repeat away. I'm sure people have forgotten. <laughs> I know I um, have. <laughs> so please refresh my memory. Yeah. Well, I mean, the thing is, it's like, you know, every time I write an article now, I have to sort of read through this. And um, I, I like part of me is like, should I? But I think I have to each time. Right. Like, uh, so. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all great thinkers are ultimately repeating a single great idea. Yeah. We're, we're all one trick ponies. Every one of us. <laughs> We just so, then mask it by talking about all kinds of other <laughs> crap, but we really all have, you know, one trick pony insights. Yeah, anyway, so, go ahead. Um, so Ulrich takes Thomas Aquinas's, um, uh, Thomas says in De Potentia 1 1, Thomas says that uh, um, Ipsum essay, uh, created essay, right, um, is. Uh, um, complete and simple, uh, yet non-subsistent, right? Um, and so Thomas Elsewhere calls uh, essay, you know, the act of all actualities, the perfection of all perfections, right? And so um, to, to speak about being, right, the, the created being or um, essay creatum, right, um, is to talk about, uh, right, the thing that allows us, or thing is the wrong word, the act that allows all of us to be, right? 
Um, right. And it is sort of that by which we might say God creates, right? Um, God creates in and through created essay, right? And by doing so, gives creation its own act of being, right? Like we're not re- we're not sort of um, always uh, sort of relying on God to like meet out a- act or being to us, right? By creating in and through this, that which is perfect um, and complete in and of itself, God really sort of lets creation be itself, right? Um, And so because created essay is complete and simple, um, yet non-subsistent, so that's the key, right? And so by non-subsistent, what Thomas means is essay does not um, subsist in and of itself, right? So you and I both subsist for now, at least of, uh, in and of ourselves, right? Yeah. We have, um, a, and there's no point at which we see essay, right? There's no sort of like clump of essay hanging around that we like <laughs> see and then we take from, right? Yeah. Um, and so the way that Ulrich understands this is because essay has no self, right? It has It has no subsistence. All it is, is giving away itself, right? That's all it is, is, is to be for another, right? Right. So um, the essay is complete and, um, and, uh, and perfect and simple, right? And, um, but it has no self to, uh, to sort of appear, we might say, in the world, right? All it does is give itself away to other things in order to exist or, or in order. Now, let's be clear. Exist. You're not talking about God as such right now. No, I'm talking about right. created essay, created essay. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So, um, I mean, so like the way that I just, you know, the way that I start to explain this to my students is like the first thing I ask them is like everything in the world, right? Like, ev- like every last thing, Right what does it have in common? Like, what can we say that everything has in common? And, and like, eventually, you know, they really do get there. They, they say everything exists. Okay. Right. Right. And in everything existing, right. What at least Thomas and, you know, not just Thomas, but, um, but Thomas, I think sort of most poignantly sees is um, we all share right in created being, we all share in this act of existence that Thomas calls created essay. Right. Okay. So, For Ulrich, the fact that essay has no subsistence in itself, right, and that all it is, is allowing other things to be, is evidence of um, creation, the character of creation itself being at at the very sort of heart of every single thing, right, Um, that that which allows me to be created essay um, is only for others, right? Um, it doesn't, it has no subsistence in itself. It keeps none of it sort of act for itself, we might say, because there is no self to have. And so because of that, for Ulrich, he he thinks that this means that being most profoundly is gift, meaning that to be at all, right? The sort of, um, to use Thomas's word, purest, um, simplest, um, most complete um, being is to be at all is to give oneself away to another. And that would mean that that sort of stamp of created being is on each and every um, creature. So, yes, yes. Which is still very uh, abstract, right? Because what we're not talking about here is that God created sort of this reservoir right. of, of, of created being right. that is non-substance yet somehow perfect. Uh, then sort of individual things kind of draw water from this reservoir of, right. of nonsense creative. It, it's, it's part and parcel with, with, with the coming into existence of individual things as such. Um, but here is important is that distinction between essence and existence that, you know, that yes, it only shows up in the form of concrete, entities beings and yet nevertheless it does point towards this rather mysterious thing called created being which is not exhausted by even the whole collective of individual things uh so i in other words, i just throw this out here as a caveat to to the to listeners is that we're not talking about here about some sort of intermediary thing called you know, not subsistent created being that that as like I said, a reservoir out of which all individual things then flow almost like a demiurge of some kind. 
Uh, that's that's not it. Uh, but anyway, it. I mean, it, just to it, sorry. Go ahead. To, one of the ways that work talks about this, right, is he says that created essay is not a mediator, right? It's pure mediation, right? And it's, it's yes. Yeah, it's one of the ways to at least try to sort of wrap your head around this. And yes. Uh oh, Rachel froze on us. OK, hopefully she comes back soon, uh, but I'll keep talking. The nature of mediation as such uh, is is the essence of Ulrich's idea here. OK, are you back? Yes. Well, oh, wait <laughs> okay. a minute. You froze on my my end. So, uh, oh, OK, I'm getting a message now that my Internet connection is unstable. And for my viewers and watchers, you'll notice I'm actually at the farm now and not at my uh, better internet location, which is our home in Scranton near the Ordinariate Parish that we attend. The internet in Scranton is super fast, super good here on the farm. It's troglodytic, Neanderthalic, <laughs> backward, and so on. But I am a Luddite, so it's befitting to my uh, to my Ludditism, if you Dang. will. Yeah, we have here, our, we don't have cable-based internet here on the farm. It's the old phone line stuff, DSL or whatever they call it. But anyway, uh, go, before we yeah. let, let's go back to what you were saying about mediation as such, because I think this is terribly important. It's a it's a very abstract point to get your mind around. This is what differentiates philosophical thinkers from non philosophical thinkers. But nevertheless, if you're still following along, this is an important point. So go ahead, Rachel. Yeah. So Ulrich says, you know, um, created beings not a mediator. It's not a it's not a you know a thing or a person, right? It's yeah. pure mediation, right? And I, I, I don't know. I think one of the ways to help us think through this is to think about um, the counterfactual, right? So if being were a thing, right? If it were that reservoir, right? What what it would end up becoming is that would end up becoming the <clears throat> the um, sort of uh, yeah like that's what we would take from right that's what we would rely on that's what we would be dependent upon right and so it would sort of take the place of god so to speak right and so yeah. that would be that that doesn't make any sense in light of creation ex nihilo right um because essentially right. you're you're placing something between the world and god right it also would mean right if there was a reservoir right it would then the question would mean the question would be well sort of who or what doles out that, or sort of like doles out that reservoir, right? Like, okay, so maybe you say there is a reservoir and then like God sort of like opens the gate every time like a new creature, right? Yeah. Comes into being, right? Spigot goes so, on, spigot yeah, goes exactly. off. Exactly. Oh, wait a minute. An aardvark doesn't eat right. quite as much as an elephant. <laughs> so I'm just going to do that. Yeah, exactly. But then notice the implication for the relationship between God and the world for that, right? Which is that, um, then uh, God is sort of uh, not hasn't really given the world its own being, actually, right? He he's sort of he's deciding when to sort of open the spigot, so to speak, right? For every new creature, right? And so um, the world is sort of uh, codependent, we might say, in a really bad way upon. That's I mean, it's kind of a messed up relationship. Like you only get you, you only get yourself like in this moment, right? Rather than the world actually being able to sort of achieve itself and really be subsistent, right? So I think um, one of the reasons why metaphysicians uh, tend to be so careful about this stuff is because once you go the other way, you have all these implications about the God world relationship that are actually like paints a really bad picture of both God and creation, right? So so it might be easy, yeah. easier to think about it if there was a mediator or if there was a reservoir what would that what would that mean then so yeah so immediate so being created being as pure mediation as such right is what we're looking at here and this is what makes possible in a sense a certain independence of creation yes I, I, there's there's a great line in balthazar's uh little poetic book heart of the world uh the very first thing ignatius press actually published of balthazar's translated by Father Simeon or Erasmo Mary Livicatus. Um, there's a great line in there where he says, "Love only happens at a distance." And, mm. and then he says, "We we are we are like God precisely in the fact that we're not God." 
and 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 I think obviously he doesn't mean, therefore, some sort of competitive relationship or that we exist independently, absolutely ontologically independently of God, that he creates us and then blows us into the wind. Bye bye. Have fun storming the castle. You're right. Uh, you know, uh, that's a bride, the uh, princess bride reference. By yeah. the way. Uh, 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 and, and so, no, there is still a dependence there. Uh, but it's a dependence which creates within us a certain a certain independent being of our own. Yes. Similar to God's being. So right. how is it similar to God's being? Do, do we not have to and then the sort of invoke Trinitarian theology here? Um, how is our being similar to God's being? Is yeah. what you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I mean, the, the way that Ulrich would say, I think, again, um, so he he thinks that the Thomistic principle of um, sort of uh, created essay being complete and simple yet non-subsistent is totally coincident with the Thomistic principle that um, the good is self-diffusive, right? right? Um, and so, um, and by good here, right now we mean God, right? Um, the good being self-diffusive. And obviously this is a platonic principle that gets taken up within Christian philosophy and theology. Um, and because Thomas is a lot more platonic than a lot of people think, but, but um, so uh, yeah, because precisely because um, essay created essay is an image of God, right? It's an image of, yeah. of, of God's being, right? And um, so because it's an image of God's being, then it too, because it's an image of the good, right? It it is also self diffusive, right? It's again giving itself away all of the time. Right. And so for, again, if that's the sort of stamp at the center of our being, so to speak, right? Like if this is what allows us to be, then we are imaging God in the fact that to be at all, right, is like deciding to be in relationship is not a second moment of our being, right? It is literally constitutive of our being. And I mean, this is true on a very sort of biological level, right? Like you don't pop into existence out of nowhere. You come from somewhere, right? And so, so to be, right, um, you receive one's existence, right? Um, and one receives one's existence and then, right, and then in order to kind of like keep that going, right, you you then are, are for another, right? Um, both morally, but also actually, right, in ontologically. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, it seems to me, is also, that's an image of God, right? A Trinitarian understanding of God. Absolutely. Uh, and the, the consequences, I mean, it's a shame that Ulrich's uh, views are not, are not more well known because they do kind of form the philosophical. I'm working on it. Oh, <laughs> oh, yes, yes, you are. You are working on it. And uh, a few others, but not, not enough. And you are one of the few out there doing it. Because his philosophical insights really were uh, important to people like Balthazar, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, I mean, they um, became friends. And um, actually, I think it was in the last issue of Comunio or maybe two issues ago. Um, Father Jacques Servet actually has an article about Ulrich's influence on Balthazar, which is uh, uh, worth reading. Um, so, yeah. Was yeah. that? Okay, I, I all all these issues of Comunio start to run together. <laughs> They're all back yeah. here on my shelf. Here, you know, I have Comunio issues going back to 1975 or so. Uh, but also, when you uh, this is a complete side note when you when you subscribe to a journal like Comunio for now going on 50 years in my case. Uh, the the issues that you have missing are a bit autobiographical when you look at them because you realize oh yeah th that's the two years when I was not really interested in Comunio for a while and <laughs> was off doing this sort of thing over here and then all of a sudden the issue picks up again so there are, there are two like two year gaps in this back here, which I need to fill eventually, uh, corresponding to two year gaps of my sanity, theological <laughs> sanity in, in, in my, well, part of it was after I left the seminary, I just was working in the corporate world and uh, just decided, well, I, I'm 
I don't have a lot of money. I'm mm -hmm. not in theological circles. And so it wasn't a repudiation of communio as it was. This just isn't in my wheelhouse anymore. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's neither here nor there. It's just a little brief autobiographical side note. <laughs> I would encourage everyone to get communio. But anyway, yeah, Jacques Servé did have an article. I didn't read it, though. Did you read oh, yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So what did he have to say? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, Balthazar was more or less a generation older than than Ulrich. Um, right. And so, um, you know, obviously, Balthazar had been writing before Ulrich and in some ways like and Ulrich had been writing before he knew Balthazar. Um, but so in a, in a lot of ways, it's it's interesting. Homo obesis, as far as I understand it, was not written like in order to sort of like ground Balthazar's theology with a metaphysics and a philosophy. Um, it's just that um, when Balthazar read Homo Obesis, he was like, here it is, right? Here, like, here's everything. Here, Here's the metaphysics. Or, I mean, not that Balthazar didn't do metaphysics himself, obviously, but but here's all this sort of groundwork that for, for all these other insights that I've been having. And so there was a, kind of an incredible coincidence um, there that then became very fruitful, right? Um, and, uh, you know, um, Balthazar's publishing house, uh, Johannes Verlag, right? The, um, they're the ones who published m most of U Ulrich's works, actually. Um, and uh, um, I believe it's Explorations 5 is um, dedicated to Ulrich, actually. Um, so... Uh, Hang on a second. Let me see. <laughs> I might be wrong. <laughs> All right. Explorations in Theology, Volume 5. Man, it's one is... of the volumes. I think it's five, but I I don't have it off the top of my head. Oh, I can't trust this. It's translated by Adrian Walker. <laughs> Actually, this one, Rachel, is dedicated to uh, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. Oh, okay. All right. I uh, so, but it's it's one of the explorations. Yes. It just isn't number five. <laughs> Sorry. And I don't want to go back. Keep going back to my shelf to get you <laughs> to find um, out. So, uh, yeah, so that so, you know, a after they sort of found each other intellectually, then there was a lot of, we might say, cross pollination between the, the two. Um, Balthazar called Homo Bissus probably one of the, you know, um, the most important work, philosophical works of the 20th century. And yeah, um, he, did. he he did so because he said he did so because um, he one of the things that he really admired about Ulrich is that he's over he was able to I, I think the phrase is something like um, he's able to overcome the baneful dualism between sort of philosophy and theology which is not to say that Ulrich um, doesn't respect the legitimate domains but that he yeah. doesn't think one has to excise revelation in order to do uh, philosophy I think so. you bring this up in your article right yeah uh, a, li a little bit that and it, and it intrigued me because in, in essence, Ulrich, while maintaining the proper distinction between faith and reason, between philosophy and theology, doesn't view it as a wall of separation so much as a right. semi-permeable, to, to borrow a biological mem metaphor, you know, a semi-permeable membrane, uh, you know, right. and that there, there is going to be cross movement of nutrients to and, to and fro. Uh, you're yeah. an ex you're an ex biology major. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore, oftentimes when you philosophize, you're going to theologize. And when you theologize, you're inherently also going to be philosophizing, uh, maintaining, however, uh, the proper distinctions between them. And I, I think that's what makes Ulrich so refreshing. Right. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, um, to bring it back to, to matter. Right. Like, I don't think he could have had the had the insights about matter if he hadn't right. been sort of taking the doctrine of creation ex nihilo so seriously, right? Um, and, no and, the, and the idea, too, of pure mediation, yes. gift reception, this is rooted in a Trinitarian understanding of, of, of being precisely as a participatory relational yes. circumcession of persons in an infinite register. Uh, as a as the, so the perfection of being is a kind of stasis of, of constant motion. Uh, so anyway, it, it's all very interesting. Now, what would be we're not exactly talking about matter anymore, but now this is very interesting to me because uh, now we're getting into sort of the, the roots of Balthasar's thought. I know that Balthasar was also influenced by Gustav Sieverth, the philosopher. Are, are there any points of contact between Ulrich and Sieverth? Yes. Um... There are. 
um see that uh so ooh, ooh, um <laughs> right i don't want to i mean <laughs> i don't want to go like too far into the weeds but um see that so ulrich has this way of explaining so you know we were just talking about the pure mediation of being right and um that that created being is pure mediation right not a mediator between god and the world um right. and um ulrich uh, so has this way of talking about it. He um, it's unique to him to a certain degree. He he calls this um, the movement into subsistence. Right in German, this is the subsistence bewegung. Um, so I uh, I use that word a lot at my dissertation defense, and my family was there, and they were like, "What what was this word you kept repeating?" Right. Um, <laughs> so, so, um, and so yeah. the movement the movement into subsistence, meaning subsistence of subsistent things, right? So that, that being, right, moves into subsistence, right? This, this is um, what, what Ulrich, uh, uh, how Ulrich's sort of trying to describe this, right? And he, um, he, he says that there are sort of three moments, we might say, within um, the subsistence, subsistence bewegung, the movement into subsistence, right? And he says that there's the moment of reality and the mo moment of ideality, and then um, this other moment in uh, German, it's bonitet, right? You have uh, realitet, ide idealitet, bonitet. And um, the way that that's been translated is bonicity, right? The move moment of bonicity. And so basically what he means by these moments are, right, um, kind of the thing itself, right? Um, uh, and uh, the and the the form, so to speak, right? So the essay and the form meet, Right. And then they have this kind of overflowing moment, right, which he calls the moment of bonitet, meaning that things are never enclosed in their own borders. Right. Just by the fact that something appears. Right. It, it means yeah. it's sort of shining beyond its own its own borders um, or it's shining yeah. beyond its own self. Right. Um, so the the moments of idealitet and realitet, right, Ide ideality and reality actually Ulrich sort of receives those from Sievert, right? But Sievert doesn't um, then move on and say, oh, you need this sort of third moment of of moving beyond, right? This this moment of bonicity. And so Ulrich kind of builds on Sievert there. Um, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, which I think is an important, it's an important uh, build um, because nothing ever stays in itself, right? In order to really say that being right, um, is gift, right, Ulrich sees that you have to have this moment of self-diffusion, which he calls the the moment of, of bonicity. And you can see the clear uh, influence here on, on Balthazar, or vice versa as well, uh, how important, especially in the theological aesthetics, this whole notion of appearing yeah. is to Balthazar. It's not pure phenomenology here, although phenomenology is is helpful in this regard, I was just reading some Max Shaler in this regard, and it's very interesting. Uh, but the appearing gives us a notion of being, created being, as inherently sort of diffusive, inherently yeah. epiphanic, yeah. inherently seeking to show outwardly its inward splendor, all right, as, as a being, as, as that which exists, this inherent need to go out, to go out, to go out, to appear. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. That's just, well, and I mean, you know, can I could I just bring it back? To, I mean, it's my thing, right? <laughs> my, well, no, go ahead. Back. I mean, I yeah. was just brought Balthazar into it and, and to <laughs> tie it to what you just said about the appearing. Yeah. So, I mean, what Ulrich says about matter then, right, is in its very nothingness, right, um, that that it doesn't exist in itself, right, that it has to be taken up by another in order to exist at all. Right. Um, in its very nothingness, it images beings non-subsistence. Right. So like, again, you know, it's it's hard to think this. Right. It's hard. It's hard to think like, what do you mean when you say that something doesn't subsist, that something doesn't subsist? Like, you know, and, and Ulrich saying, well, look, we actually have an image of this. Right. In creation. Right. This. So, again, this thing that that Plato sort of saw that we could only use a bastard reason about that we only could kind of look at like you know through sideways right um that uh Ulrich is saying he thinks that matter matters very nothingness is an image of this non-subsistence of being right and so in this nothingness of matter 
um, this that all matter is is this readiness to sort of be taken up by another. We see that being itself, right? All rather than being taken up by another, all it wants to do is right, um, give another to be actually, right? right? Yeah. Allow another to be. And so we have this really beautiful symmetry, so to speak, right? Uh, of 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 gift, right, within creation itself, right? Being wants another to yeah. be matter in its nothingness, right? And it's and it's um sort of readiness to be taken up by another, right? Also kind of a, a, is an image of beings non-subsistence. And, 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 and argues for the fact that pure potentiality always already has a constitutive orientation towards actuality. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, that it's not just sitting there as some sort of passive, inert uh, potential, completely indifferent to whether or not it's actualized or not. Uh, that it has this inner orientation towards precisely being instantiated in, right. in things. And, and, you know, I mean, interestingly, and again, this is why I think a sort of understanding of Aris an Aristotelian prime matter that just sits there is a, is a, yeah. is not a, the right one because Aristotle says in the physics that um, Hule does yearns for the divine. I mean, he says that in the physics, yes. right. And then, yes. And then Dionysius picks this up within the sort of Christian Neoplatonic tradition. And one of the things, Dionysius says, non-being desires God, right? And that, that's what Dionysius says. And then it's desire of God, right? Um, Dionysius says, because it desires God, right? It is then given to be an image of God in a really particular way because God is above form, right? And everything else in creation has form and it's only in matter, Right, that we then sort of glimpse um, something created that doesn't have form, right? And so, so this sort of lowest of the low, right, is given to sort of to look like God, right, in this very particular way, obviously, but is given to image God in this way. Well, that's interesting uh, because, yeah, God is beyond form, right? But God is obviously not anti-form; He's not a-formal. It would be perhaps better to say that God is supra formal. Yes. But that would be somewhat different then, though, from matter. Which is a formal, right? It's below form, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Yes. And and so Dionysius, I mean, Dionysius recognizes that, right? Um, uh, you know, absolutely. But he's saying, like, even within creation itself, God gives something to to image this kind of supra formal. Um, yeah, yeah. and so it's analogous to it yes. yeah um so i did it's just i i'm not it i mean i i read some dionysius but it's been many years and i should probably go back into to reading i've been busy lately rereading re maximus the confessor thanks to my friend jordan wood getting me back into reading maximus uh and reading jordan's book on maximus which i which is a good book i have some disagreements with it but it's it's a good book uh anyway so uh, any um we've been talking now for about an hour and, and 10 or 15 minutes i'm trying to think of any further questions i'm do, what do you do you have any further elaborations that you would like to engage in here miss rachel sure um i mean so the the where i sort of take the article um is that not only is matter an image of the nonsense subsistence of being, right? The, the nothingness in and of itself of matter. But what matter does is um, actually sort of shows that um, that God is willing to give so completely that he's actually sort of like willing to let us forget about him to a certain extent, right? Um, yeah. Because precisely what matter does, and, and we can, I feel like the modern world is kind of indicative of the, uh, indicative of this right like the way that we have interpreted for example evolution as if somehow like matter in and of itself right ended up to where we are today right like it just yeah. like um and what it sh to, for Ulrich and he, he actually has a whole another it's I mean he calls it an essay it's like a short book basically but like he has a whole another thing on evolution um but that um what God does in giving matter, Right, because remember, all of this is God intended for the world to be this way. Right, it's not an afterthought or something like this. Right. What God does in giving matter is actually sort of gives the world so completely that it looks like 
almost that we sort of do this on our own, so to speak, right? Um, yeah. That that what matter is, right? That this this readiness to be, this potency to be, right? Um, is actually it it's a it's it's him allowing the creature to be as freely as free. Um, as possible, right? Yes. Precisely because you have this readiness to be taken up into being that, and um, it there's no sort of dependence, or, or at least, sorry, there's no obvious dependence on God. There is ultimately, but he is willing to let us be so free that it almost looks like we we come into being on our own, right? Um, and so yeah. the, the kind of, for Ulrich, at least, the, the idea that, um, yeah, that, that, you know, um, basically a sort of Darwinian, evolution that this all just happened because somehow yeah. the powers lie in matter itself right is almost proof that, like that god wants his creature to be so free that um he, he's just willing to kind of uh hide in the background so to speak yeah yeah the the whole question of the hiddenness of god mediation that you know that we experience god in a mediated way and not immediate way and of course sin also complicates right uh us knowing god as well uh, so, but there is certainly, there is certainly a mediation there that means that God's very existence isn't exactly transparent to us. Right. It's not exactly self-evident. There's an opaqueness that remains. Uh, and, and the opaqueness probably has to be there in order for us to be truly, you know, in some sense, independent. Yeah. Uh, and free. And free. That's what yeah. I mean. That's I'm, I don't mean ontologically independent right. in some radical sense which would make God competitive with us. Uh, but yeah, sort of free this, this zone, you know, that's Balthazar too. I hate to keep bringing Balthazar back in, but you know, the whole zone of the interplay, the dramatic interplay of divine and human freedom requires a certain space uh, for that to happen, for that to play out. Anyway, we should probably wrap this. We've been going, like I said, an hour and 15 minutes. Can I just I keep... say one more thing? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, I mean, it's just to the point of metaphysics in general, right? Because, um, you know, you sort of brought up earlier, like people are like, what does this have to do with anything? Why is it so abstract? Like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which, you know, um, I don't, yeah. I mean, I, I've sort of always had this bent as soon as I got into philosophy and theology, I sort of <coughs> wanted to go as deeply as possible, Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, as you know. <laughs> yep. so, um, but I, I, I just want to, I think that, like I sort of did earlier, right, the point is a lot of times with metaphysics, right, the point, metaphysics is never supposed to be sort of like um, a, a, a somebody, um, you know, displaying his erudition, right, um, but, but, but kind of similar to the point that you made earlier about quantum physics, right, in, in science, there's a difference between terms of art and jargon, Right. Terms of art are things that you kind of have to um, use in order to explain what's going on. And then jargon is, um, well, I want to confuse my listener or my reader or something like that. Right. And make them think I'm really smart. Yeah. Right? Metaphysics is similar, it seems to me. Right. Like that. It's really important that we get this stuff right, precisely because in the counterfactual, there are all these downstream implications. Right. If if being is a reservoir, then God is this kind of miserly figure just like meeting out being when he decides to. I mean, that's a horrible picture of God, right? And so yeah. what you think at the beginning, I mean, Thomas says this, right? Like a small mistake at the beginning is going to have, you know, all of these ripple effects. What you think at the beginning is very abstract and sort of like abstruse and maybe even obscurantist, right? Like is actually, I mean, so incredibly important for how we understand our relationship to God and the relationship between God and the world. And so uh, uh, I think, right, the task of the metaphys metaphysician is actually to guard being, right, to guard the world as yes. it is and to be able to state the truth of being. And that's and, really important. And as Balthazar says, uh, I mean, and because Christianity has, in a sense, become the guardian of metaphysics, yeah. you know, Christianity has become the guardian of being. Yes, uh, because nobody else. There really are very, very few systems of thought out there that are especially you know, with especially with regard to Catholicism. That are out there as the guardians of metaphysics. Uh, in fact, you know, as you well know, there are strong theological voices from within even the Catholic Church that would argue that we just don't not only do we not need metaphysics, but it's a positive hindrance. Right. So uh, I'm thinking of people like Jean-Luc Marion and, and people like that. 
and I like Jean Le. His, his stuff is really good. I, I, I read it. It's very insightful and profound. Uh, but I think ultimately his anti-metaphysical approach is just wrong. And, and I think the church has, I mean, because in one sense, there's no escaping metaphysics, right? The, the thing that I don't understand is that someone who is a genius, as Marion is, why, and, and so intelligent, why he can't see that his very anti-metaphysical position implies a certain metaphysical position. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, well, it, it's just like, you can't escape meta. There's no, the, resistance is futile. <laughs> There's no escaping metaphysics. Uh, yeah. And as, as hard as it is, we have to attend to it. Or Rachel, I'm not trying to give you the bums rush. I'm not, but I do keep getting these little messages of unstable internet connection, <laughs> which is why no, no. I've I been trying have to do to, work too. So <laughs> yeah, you know. So before we have this very awkward and abrupt ending to our thing, <laughs> I and since I don't know how to edit things very well, and so so I usually just post it as is. You know, I was like, okay, and then I get all these messages. How come it ended without any? That, that's why. All right. Uh, so let's let's end this properly okay uh, which is i thank you for coming on today Thanks for uh, me. and i hope that it spurs more of my viewers to try and understand and to read more in the philosophy of ferdinand ulrich perhaps someday they'll be reading a book of yours rachel on ferdinand ulrich i hope so uh, and in the meantime though you can they pick up homo abyssus translated by david c schindler and sink their teeth into. I mean, in some sense, when you, if you're going to pick up Ulrich and just read him, you know, and you're not, you don't have a background in metaphysics or philosophy, it's going to be like jumping into a raging stream midstream, you know. Uh, but still, sometimes there's value even in that, um, you know, just to jump in to read yes. somebody, uh, <laughs> even if it's a bit like drink, trying to get a sip of water out of a raging <laughs> fire hose, you know, you, you're still getting a sip of water. You might yeah. get inundated <laughs> in your face, but you're still getting a sip of water. But anyway, so thank you for coming on, Rachel. Any last words? No, thanks for having me. It's always great to talk to you, Larry. And the readers should know, too, we've been trying to, this This interview has been canceled a couple of times. Once I had laryngitis, another time, I think my power went out or something. Yeah, your power at the house. went out, yeah. Power went out in Scranton, and so I lost my interwebs and so <laughs> on. So this finally happened. I thought it was very good. Um, <laughs> I really did. This is profound stuff, but really important stuff. And I, and I think we need to talk about it more often. All right. So thanks a lot, Rachel. Okay. I'm going to, uh, thanks for coming on and we'll have you on again. I'm going to hit stop record. Thanks for everybody for listening.